So we're going to answer your questions, your follow-ups, your feedback here in this episode of the Seven Figure Squad happening in three, two, one. Let's go. Never short stopping. Now I'm winning like I'm Jada. Steady through the rigor. Yeah, I'm getting bigger. Just fighting in them trenches. Now I'm making seven figures like. What's cracking, everybody? Money Smart Guy Matt Sapala here hailing to you from the Money Smart home office. And uh, as many of you know, we do these Sunday night biblical Bible studies according to God's perspective on money, business, success, wealth. And uh, we've been enjoying this uh, since we've been doing this in, since December of 2020, 2020. And uh, we're going to get with your questions here in this episode. Again, we want to announce that contest because we have until 75,000 subs to come up with a name for these Sunday night biblical Bible studies. And here are some of the names that you guys came up with, some of the names that you guys came up with here. Again, the winner of some of these names that we're selecting here, we're, uh, we're screenshotting them, we're setting them to the side because once we hit 75,000 subs, we're going to select the winner, the one that picks the right name for these Sunday night Bible, biblical Bible studies um, is going to earn not only $500, we're going to send it from us to you, but also your church or your charity in your name is also going to receive $500 too as well. So please drop your thoughts about these Sunday night Biblical Bible sessions should be named. All right, so let's get into these questions. Question number one. Which Bible version are you using? Thank you for a great video. Sure. The, the Bible version I've been using a lot of is either the King James Version, the New King James Version, the New uh, International Version, and also the New Living Translation. I look at four or five different translations of the Bible because I know the Bible is broken down into many different uh, ways in perspective and translation helps me understand God's word from different translations. So for example, obviously many of you know that the Old Testament was written in, in one language and the New, New Testament written in another language and the translators have to put it together in English. And so it's seeing different versions of the Bible helps me understand through different uh, versions of the text what God is looking to translate. Because sometimes different versions um, have a different meaning based on how it's written. And so I just want a uh, various amount of insight into the subject matter because certain scriptures aren't literal. In other words, that four or five people read the same thing, have four or five different understandings of it. And so that's why I look at different translations of the Bible. So NIV, King James Version, New King James Version, and uh, New Living Translation. Question number two, money smart guy. Do you think there's a difference between isolation and solitude? There is. Uh, isolation is a forced act where you're separating yourself from humanity. You're separating yourself from being connected. You're separating yourself from God's connection with you and through God's people. So you isolate yourself because you don't want to deal with a riffraff and you feel safe. And, you know, a lot, by the way, a lot of men do this, right? We isolate ourselves. A lot of people that don't want to deal with chaos isolate themselves, but that's not what we're designed for. Uh, however, the word solitude means you, you just need some quiet time to get in God's presence. In other words, you might need to separate yourself so therefore you can be in prayer. There's many times there where Jesus separate himself to pray, to get connected with what God wanted him to do with his life. But he wasn't isolated. He was still connected. He was in solitude. So, yes, there is a difference between isolation and solitude. All I have is a gift from God. But is it okay to be hungry to make more money? Sure. I mean, there's a natural desire. There's a natural ambition inside of you, a natural competitive drive inside you that God has obviously placed in you. So to ask your question, is it wrong to be hungry to make money? Of course not. Absolutely not. You know, men were designed to be providers, to hunt, to go out there and to, you know, to help other people by you going out there and, and, and farming and hunting and, and, and providing. So, no, I mean, if you feel whatever that gift from God is, if it's able to help you manifest the provisions or the resources to help those you love and care about, then 100% go for it. Because in that process, God is able to manifest his goodness and his glory with inside you instead of you being you know, uh, reserved and, and, and unexpressive of that gift. So my friend, if your hunger and desire using that gift is uh, uh, encouraging you and in, in, in fighting with inside you to express itself, knock yourself out. Does God approve in investing in cryptocurrency, Bitcoin or altcoin? I don't know. I have zero. Does he approve? It? I don't know. I have zero idea, zero clue. Uh, but that's where your relationship with God comes in. Now, if God places a financial instrument here on earth to say whether or not you should put your money into it, well, listen, in Proverbs, King Solomon says, a man is wise if he looks into the matter. 
If you're looking to the matter just based on what your friends tell you about Bitcoin or whatever cryptocurrency that you want to get involved in, it looks good and your eyes are getting big and there's greed flashing and I can make money in a short period of time and boom, boom, boom. Well, potentially that might be the sin. It's not the specific investment. It's not the financial in, 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 instrument. It's your way about going about doing it. And so, you know, sometimes people go out there to get rich quick and whatever case may be. And uh, I've never been down with that type of process. There's been many opportunities been placed in my life where I can get rich quick, but I've also seen them quickly crash and burn. And so I believe that God wants you to uh, take whatever financial resources he sends your way, look into the matter. And from there, you make your decision based on what you feel God is guiding you to do. If you want to ask me, do I put my money into cryptocurrency? Three, four, five percent of it is risk money that potentially might be lost because then again, that's investing. But I'm not putting the lion's share of my savings investing into cryptocurrency. By the way, quick disclaimer, this is zero financial advice to you. Uh, this is you just hearing a message from a friend. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not giving you any investment advice. So please don't take what I'm saying right now as financial guidance or financial advice. Thank you very much. God bless you. <laughs> How do you get rid of greedy emotions? How do you get rid of greedy emotions? Um, you know, I, I think there's a natural disposition within inside of us that wants, that wants more. Uh, and therein lies the sin, right? And so uh, there's nothing wrong with being ambitious and there's nothing wrong. So I think you have to have a clear definition of what a greedy emotion is causing you to do. Is it causing you to sin? Is it causing you to steal? Is it causing you to break laws? Is it causing you to, to take from somebody else so therefore you can gain yourself? So, you know, you have to define what that is. Now, if it's you wanting to compete, if it's you wanting to express and create more of what God has sent you away and make the most of it, I don't think that's greedy. I think that's you just taking advantage of that blessing and being a proper steward of that blessing and to make the most of it. But if it's causing you to stumble, if it's causing you to steal, if it's causing you to sin, then therein lies the greed. And that is not good. Could you please do a video on how to find purpose behind your work? How to find purpose behind your work? Ooh, that's a, that's a great one. Um, do a video. Okay, I'll, I'll come up with a process or a formula on how to create create purpose and find purpose um, afterward. But uh, I can't tell you that when I get, when I got started in the insurance industry, when I got started from life after the military, I can't tell you that what I was doing in the insurance industry was naturally purposeful. Why? Because I was stuck in survival mode. So probably that's one of the first step. So whatever God gives you your way, are you making a living? Are you rising above? Are you, are you listening to what God has to say? What God is blessing you with? The opportunities, are you looking for opportunities? Or you're constantly saying, oh, this is a scam, this is not that, right? Are you looking through things? Are you educating yourself about money? Are you educating yourself about business? You know, um, you know, oftentimes people wonder who Jesus' first recruit was to become a disciple. And quite frankly, he recruited an entrepreneur. He recruited Peter, who was an entrepreneur who had boats, who had fish, had fishermen working with him and for him. So I wonder why he did that. Why did Jesus recruit a fisherman to fulfill his purpose? Why do you recruit an entrepreneur to fulfill his purpose? I don't know. We'll find out when we get to heaven, I guess. But I believe that once you rise above the level of survivor mentality and just surviving just to get by, once you rise above the level of just being financially free and financially independent, you're going to find purpose. So I think once you remove money from the situation, um, I think that's when you find your purpose. Now, sadly, a lot of people say, well, in the meantime, I'm not paying my bills. Well, Sometimes the passion doesn't pay the bills. So you have to find something that pays the bills that allows you to pay your earthly obligations so that therefore you can find what God has in store for you in terms of purpose. So that would be my suggestion to you. Can you do a video about dealing with the enemy's attack on our mindset that stops us from taking action? I've had experience where I want to so badly to take the next action and literally feel paralyzed in my mind and just can't. Yeah. Um, video, I'm oh, sure I think that's another video we can create, but my short answer to that would be, here's a good book. I, by the way, I've got a stack of books here that I've read over my life, some of the most profound books I've read over my life that helps me with money, uh, business, success, uh, wealth, and prosperity. And a good book for you to read would most likely be by this gentleman, Napoleon Hill's Outwitting the Devil. And uh, uh, one of the profound things he talks about in the book, Outwitting the Devil, he talks about not being a drifter. Now, what, what, what does he mean by being a drifter? You, you do one thing, you do this thing, you do this thing, you do that thing, you keep drifting. 
and you never gain confidence in anything because you keep drifting. And so potentially, I don't know your situation, but find that one thing that you can plant and, and, and plant your roots in, that you can anchor down with and get good at it from a financial perspective, pay the bills, rise above and, and have some level of success in that thing. Because once you stop drifting, financially drifting, you're gonna potentially find yourself stopped spiritually drifting too as well. And by the way, just because things get hard doesn't mean that God is not there with you. God's not there next to you. I found in some of my most fearful moments, in some of my most greatest moments of anxiety, that if I just paused and prayed and said, God, what do you want me to see in this moment? Strengthen me, guide me, lead me, coach me, teach me. It is in those moments I found God leading me into the direction necessary for me to take my life. That's in those moments of fear that God shows himself the greatest if you choose to trust him. So give that a shot. How do you weave around the negativity and the bad motivation to make money? How did you overcome and how do you make sure those with bad intentions don't join you to contaminate your wealth and reputation with God? Yeah, I think you have to figure out what money and success, wealth and prosperity stands for in your life. You know, the way I look at money, wealth, success, prosperity, I'm just used as a steward to elevate so therefore I can impact those in positions of influence and power. So I want to have conversations. I want to, I want to be used by God in those situations. Just like many characters in the Bible have been used in many situations to sit amongst kings, to be used in the marketplace, to be used in, in government. That's God's people. I mean, God is creating you to be a powerful, mighty force for him, for his good. And so when you're thinking about the enemies, you think about the negative thoughts, the tracks come away. I'm glad you are identifying it that way because, yes, the enemy wants nothing more than to have God's people not in those positions. Right? And so if you've identified what your definition of success and wealth and prosperity, what money can do for you, not for you, but money can do you know, in, your, in your situation of elevating you, all I do is look at money that way. And one, I remember one time a consultant came to my office. He says, Matt, with your business or without your business, you're the same person. Right? Because money doesn't define me. Um, um, success and titles don't define me. I'm just one of God's messengers, one of God's stewards here to do the most of what he's given me. So consider elevating yourself in that manner. Have you ever thought about people who have health issues and want to work diligently but not able to? That would affect their financial security. So you talk, I think he's talking about a you know, physical handicap. Sure. Uh, what comes to mind is I remember a young lady in her office. She runs her office paralyzed. She's got eight kids paralyzed, and she runs her own office in New Orleans. Uh, tax office, life insurance office. So, you know, I'm reminded of so many different people that were born with arms and legs and still able to be great public speakers, and not given the financial, not given the physical gifts that many other people have had, and yet able to make the most of their brain, their spirit, their heart their message. And I remember Nick Vujicic coming into our office. He got no arms, no legs, bottom line, no excuses. God was using him in a mighty and powerful way to affect hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. And we're just blessed to have him at our event. So if you're thinking that your physical handicap is keeping you from doing what you're doing, listen, God has used people that are deaf, blind, uh, that are lepers, uh, uh, disease conditions, no arms, no legs. He's done a mighty powerful, because all of, you gotta think about this, you are God's creation. No matter how he created you, no matter how he formed you, appreciate that, be thankful in that, and God can use you. So my friend, whoever you are, don't let your physical handicap keep you. Stop comparing with yourself with other people. Ask God what God can do in your life. What if you do not attend a church? Do you give to charities or still donate to churches? So if you don't attend a church, my, my suggestion is you do attend some form of church. You have some form of church community. Um, if you are around uh, other churches or charity, I mean, I, I gather you're asking the question about tithing or giving. But sure, uh, my suggestion to you, you know, Hebrews, it talks about that you should continue to surround yourself and meet with one another to encourage and uplift with one another. And so as part of the process of you growing as a, a faith-based, you know, believer in terms of building and being part of a community. So... Uh, so the short answer, sure, you can give to church, charity, whatever the case may be. I mean, giving is a great habit, no matter what. But my long-term answer for you, my friend, is to find some form of church and church community. I will become a millionaire when I refuse to allow depression and apathy overtake me. 
Any suggestions other than medication? Any suggestions outside of, well, listen, you know, depression, listen, I'm not a medical expert. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not a medical expert. I can't tell you what to take, what not to take. But I, I'm just recalling about my own personal journey through PTSD and many of the Marines I served with, their journey through PTSD. You know, depression usually evolves around somebody looking at what happened to them. So, for example, if you're sitting in a car and you look out the rearview mirror and you're going forward, right? You're, you got your car in drive, you're going forward, but you keep looking out the rearview mirror, in my opinion, that's depression. And eventually, not only are you going to hurt uh, yourself, but worse, you're going to hurt somebody else. So, if you are constantly looking, you're going forward in your life and you're constantly looking out the rearview mirror of things that happen to you, that monster, whatever that is, is right there, big and bold inside the rear of your mirror. But if you move your perspective and move your vision to going forward to what God can do in your life and you're moving forward, guess what happens to that monster in the rear of your mirror? It gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Again, I'm not giving you medical advice, but what I'm, I'm sharing with you, and when my, my, my own dealings with PTSD and many of my service members dealing with PTSD is the moment we found our next move, our next chapter, um, something we can focus ahead with that depression started getting less and less and less and less affected. We became less and less affected in our lives because we're thinking about what we can do and not what we've been through. Well, that wraps it up. I appreciate you guys dropping your comments and your questions, and your follow-ups. Comment section below. I promise you, we get back to you. And it looks like the last Sunday of every month, our episode has been about Q&A, giving back to you in referencing your questions, your feedback. One thing I want to reference you to as well, going forward, in addition to the Bible, is helping, is helping yourself with some of these books. These are some of the books that I've read over my lifetime, some of my favorite books I read over my lifetime, dealing with wealth, money, prosperity, success, generational wealth. And uh, we'll put a bunch of links in the description below. So potentially you guys can take a look at some of these books and see which ones that you want to cruise and, and, and consume and, and for your benefit. Uh, again, I've been, the last few months, uh, two months here, I've been referencing this book a lot, The Richest Man Who Ever Lived, which is written by Stephen K. Scott, because he talks a lot about my favorite king in the Bible, which is King Solomon the wisest and richest king who ever lived. And, uh, and so if you're looking at uh, the contest and you want to say, man, I want to label these Sunday night biblical Bible studies, again, drop your thoughts on what that name of these series should be, Sunday night uh, biblical Bible studies, uh, from the perspective of wealth, money, and prosperity, where the Bible exposes, hey, man, we want you to be successful. We want you to be rich. We want, to be, we want you to be uh, blessing other people, obviously outside of yourself. We want you blessing other people. And so we want your help in naming these Sunday night episodes. Again, the winner, once we cross 75,000 subs, we're going to select the winner who names these Sunday night Bible studies. And again, you're going to win $500 and your church or charity will also receive $500 in your name as a thank you for labeling these Sunday night biblical Bible studies. Again, if you have any more questions, feedbacks, follows, drop it in the comment section below. Before I wrap stuff up, let me reference you to this video here, which our original first Q&A session done a month ago. And again, this episode right here, which is the biblical Bible study that started this all on, on, on December, in December of 2020. And if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like, follow our Facebook business page, Money Smart Guy. And if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe and hit notifications to be alerted next time we upload our next episode. That being said, guys, thanks for tuning in. It's a Sunday, I'm excited for my week. Ahead. With that being said, I'm your money smart guy. And until we meet again, continue smart, continue smart, and be money smart today. God bless you guys. Bye bye.